Council Bluffs, Iowa is a Midwestern city with a small town feel. It has many hardworking people who are willing to help their neighbors, friendly people. It's a quiet, rural community. On the outskirts of the city, on the border near Nebraska, is Big Lake Park. The park is huge. It's almost 200 acres, and there are lakes, one filled with rainbow trout, hiking trails, and playgrounds. Big Lake Park was known to be a place that families frequented. It was very peaceful. But what happened here on a cold winter night in 2015 was part of a mystery that stumped police for years. On December 5th, 2015, a woman was at Big Lake Park taking an evening stroll. She'd gone to the park to think while alone on the walking trail in the dark. She took a seat on a bench to rest for a moment. She was approached by another woman. She said a female approached her from behind, told her to get on the ground, and then fired a shot at her leg. She said the female ran off into the woods, and then she felt it was safe, so she walked this pathway and uh, called 911 because she had left her phone in her car. 911, what's the address of your emergency? I've been shot in the leg. Oh, my, my feet like it's soaked with blood. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> the assailant still there by? I don't think so. I took on running. Do you know what she looked like at all? No, she was behind me. Council's police responded. Uh, they had a helicopter over, could not find a suspect. This was a shocking event to have occur but no one was able to find this woman with a gun running through Big Lake Park. It's a mystery that started three years earlier, 10 minutes from Big Lake Park in Omaha, Nebraska, with a man named Dave Krupa. Dave Krupa was a 35-year-old mechanic. I was so fascinated by the fact that Dave Krupa was just a normal guy, a really nice guy. He wasn't the kind of guy you'd expect to find in the middle of a murder mystery. My name is Leslie Rule, and I'm an author. Leslie Rule was so intrigued by this story that she wrote a book about it called A Tangled Web. For fans of true crime, her last name might sound familiar. Rule is the daughter of legendary true crime author Ann Rule, who wrote the book The Stranger Beside Me about her friendship with Ted Bundy. Rule is carrying on the family tradition. Dave Krupa liked women. He made no secret about that, and he made no apologies. Dave Krupa was recently separated from Amy Flora, his long-term mate. They had two children together. They'd been together for 12 years. And he was on his own for the first time in a very long time. Dave Krupa moved to Omaha in 2012. He got a small kind of sad single dad apartment, and he got a job at an auto repair shop there. I didn't know how to venture back into the dating pool. I'd been out of it for a long time, so I felt pretty rusty. I was sitting in an apartment by myself at the time with no furniture, so internet dating was the thing. That was the way to go. The first person Dave met on an online dating site was a woman by the name of Liz Gallier. Her full name is Shanna Elizabeth Gallier, but she went by her middle name, Liz. Liz was a single mother with two children, and her kids were about the same age as Dave's kids. She had a business, Liz's housekeeping. Liz loved taking selfies and sending them to her friends. I thought Liz was very pretty. I was attracted to her right away. Uh, so then we set up a date. Dave's first dates with Liz were at a coffee shop and they just sat and chatted. She was sexy, she was bright and shiny, and she was very engaging. They had a lot of fun together, they got along really well, and it was just a very casual thing. Dave was upfront. He absolutely did not want a commitment. He just wanted to have a little fun, and he was clear with every woman he met that that was the case. And Dave was starting to meet a lot of women. Mary, Kathy, Joyce, Beth, Margaret, Sandra. If the chemistry was there and the woman was willing, Dave was more than happy to explore a sexual relationship. Well, I was kind of going wild, just, you know, 
being free for the first time in a long time. When Dave's outlook on casual hookups changed, when he met somebody the old-fashioned way, face-to-face -face in a chance encounter. Six months after I met Liz, I'm at the counter managing the shop, and I'm the person greeting customers when they come in, and an extremely attractive woman walks in the door. It's a woman named Carrie Farber. She brought her Ford Explorer into his shop to be worked on, and she was beautiful, a light-hearted air about her. When we looked at each other, there was a little spark. You know, we both smiled. You know, you feel that sometimes. Carrie Farber was a 37-year-old single mother to a 14-year-old son. She was a computer programmer at a big firm in Omaha. She's showing me something inside the vehicle, and we're standing there, and we're very close, you know, within a couple inches of each other, and there's some tension. Carrie talked to me about meeting Dave, and she was like, you know, this guy, totally not my type, but there was just something there. Then a few days later, he came across her profile on the same online dating site that he had used when he met Liz. So Carrie and I uh, ended up going to Applebee's for our first date. We hit it off. As we're getting up to leave, I asked Carrie if she wanted to come over and hang out. Uh, and she said, yeah. So we went back to my place. We shared a kiss. And then it got a little hotter and a little heavier. And then Carrie stopped and said, OK, if we're going to do this and this implying sex, that's all it is. Where you're not my boyfriend, I'm not your girlfriend. I felt like I hit the jackpot with that. I, I couldn't have wrote it better. One slightly awkward thing, the night of Dave and Carrie's first date, Liz Goyer came by Dave's apartment to pick up some things that she'd left there. I walked Carrie out the front door, and she walked right by Liz, and they probably saw each other for six seconds. It was just a brief encounter, maybe 10 seconds or less, but this encounter would go on to have lasting ramifications for all three of them. Carrie didn't seem at all bothered by her encounter with Liz. In fact, she didn't even mention it when she visited with her friend Amber. She said that during the date she had fun and that she laughed a lot and hadn't laughed like that in a long time, and she didn't know what would happen, but it was working right now. Carrie's job happened to be right around the corner from where I lived versus an hour from where she lives. She had a big project coming up at work. She was working very late hours. Dave offered for her to stay at his house so that she wouldn't have to make that commute back and forth. I mean, at this point, I've known her two weeks and she's got a key to my apartment. I was feeling pretty uh, comfortable with her. November 13th, 2012, Dave wakes up and gets ready for work. And about 6.30 AM, he leaves for work for the day. Well, I give her a kiss and I say, I'll see you later. When Dave said goodbye to Carrie that morning, he had absolutely no idea of the nightmare that his life was about to turn into. My phone starts blowing up with texts from Carrie. I hate you. You ruined my life. What is going on? I was blown away. November 13th, 2012. Dave Krupa wakes up and gets ready for work. And about 6.30 AM, he gives Carrie a kiss, and he leaves for work for the day. Carrie Farber was his girlfriend of two weeks, and they were getting along so well that she sometimes spent the night at his apartment. It was conveniently close to her work, which was just half a mile away. She's on the couch, got her laptop out. She's doing her thing. So I got to go to work, so I give her a kiss, and I say, I'll see you later. I had expected to see Carrie that evening. Mid-morning, Dave received a text, and he glanced at it. It was a message from Carrie. She texts me and says, uh, let's move in together, which was very left field, because we had already talked about that not happening. As soon as I can, I text her back and say, I'm not interested. I can't do that. We haven't known each other nearly long enough for that. And almost immediately, I get a message back that says, fine, I hate you. I'm dating someone else. I don't want to see you anymore. Uh, you know, go away. Lots of profanity. I didn't know what to think. I was blown away. She just changed very quickly from the fun and happy person that he had known just that morning. 
It was a day, maybe a day and a half of radio silence, and then my phone starts blowing up with texts from Carrie. Along the lines of, I hate you, you ruined my life, you're a terrible person. I thought, okay, I don't need this in my life. I dodged a bullet. They'd been dating for just two weeks, and he figured that maybe she'd been putting on an act, and she wasn't who he thought she was. So who was Carrie Farver? She grew up in this small town called Macedonia, Iowa. Macedonia is a very small town. It's a very nice place to raise kids because you can um, let your kids walk down the street without worrying. They can ride their bikes around town and just a friendly place to live. Carrie was very close to her mother, Nancy. They talked every day. She had a lot of friends. She was very gregarious. By all accounts, Carrie lived fully. When you look at the photograph, she's vivacious. Her hairstyles are constantly changing. She's experimenting with her look and with her life. You noticed Carrie when she walked into her room. She had a laugh, she had a smile. You were drawn to her. In an interview that Carrie did with her local paper for her high school graduation, she said she wanted to be known as always having a smile on her face and for being a little bit crazy. And all of her friends and family say Carrie was whip smart. Early on, she was, I mean, even in high school, I remember Carrie being amazing with numbers and computers. There was a turning point in Carrie's life when she was 22 years old and got pregnant. The relationship with the father didn't work out and Carrie became a single mom. She decided she was gonna bring the baby up by herself. She was going to have that baby no matter what and be the best mom she could be. Max was always at the forefront of what Carrie did. He was her number one. She just doted on him all the time. But I think she was a little overwhelmed just being on her own in her late 20s. She started developing depression. Carrie had been diagnosed in her 20s with bipolar disorder. Uh, there was one point when she just pretty much was underneath the covers for uh, a good week, maybe 10 days. She was scared about it, but at the same time knew that she was taking all the steps that she needed to to keep it in check and under control. She had been seeing therapists and was on medication. There was a couple of times when she just, she would stop taking the medication because she said, Mom, it just, I feel like I'm just numb. But by 2012, Carrie was in a very good place. She landed a good job as a computer programmer. She was super excited and talked a lot about how that was going to be kind of a life changer for her and for Max, being able to provide in a better way. Max was just going into High school, Carrie was so excited about classes he was taking and the sports that he was playing. Ride the wake, Max. She was his cheerleader. There's some video of Carrie urging on Max as he's water skiing. Carrie also had a new guy she was dating, Dave Krupa. In November, Carrie asked her mother, Nancy, to keep her son, Max, for a few days while she stayed with Dave so she could be closer to work. Right around the same time that Dave got the text from Carrie asking to move in, Carrie sent a text to her mother, Nancy. I started getting text messages that said that she was taking a job in Kansas, which totally threw me. When I said something to Max about it, he said, well, she had kind of looked at a job down in Kansas. He thought possibly there was a job down there she went to. So I texted her back and she would not call me and talk to me. Normally I would talk to her at least once a day. It was starting to concern me that she wasn't calling me. But Nancy figured she'd see Carrie soon because Carrie's half-brother was getting married in just a few days. Her son Max was to be an usher, and she promised Max that she would return for the wedding. I was needing to know when she was going to pick up her son to go to this wedding. She wasn't answering me. Carrie didn't show up to pick up Max, and she didn't call 
Everybody was stunned. That was the final straw for Nancy. That's when I reported her missing. I called the sheriff's office, and they had somebody come out, and they took my report. Nancy mentioned to the police that Carrie had been diagnosed as bipolar. I said, well, yes, she was on medication. The police jumped on that and said, when somebody who's bipolar stops taking their meds, sometimes it can start of some really erratic behavior. They didn't take it too seriously. She was a grown woman. She was still communicating with people. I just wasn't getting a very urgent reaction from the police, and they just weren't concerned about it. Things are going to get stranger and scarier. Carrie writes, my favorite thing to do is stand outside your window and stare at you. Don't know how many times I changed my phone number. She was no longer just ranting at a boyfriend that things didn't go well with. She was flat out stalking him. What do you do when somebody invades every space of your life? This man's life is about to become terrifying. What had he done to make her hate him so much? In the space of a couple of hours, she had gone from what seemed like the perfect woman to a spiteful, foul-mouthed nut. Carrie Farber is nowhere to be found. Her family is bewildered, and the police are suspecting she might be having some sort of breakdown. As for Dave Krupa, in the days since receiving her first bizarre text messages, he receives a barrage of angry messages. She started texting him a bunch of profanities, calling him names, telling him she hated him. They were bad, and they were just all about how bad of a person I am. Carrie was acting like a woman scorned. Her messages were filled with jealousy and rage. Carrie's rage seems to be focused on his on-again, off-again ex-girlfriend, Liz, who he had dated before Carrie. Which is confusing to Dave, because uh, Carrie seemed to be so unaffected by her first interaction with Liz. And Carrie is contacting Liz directly, too. Liz gets into contact with me and says that now Carrie is harassing her via text uh, and email. She was very upset. She wanted to know how this woman that she just had this chance encounter with at Dave's apartment got her phone number, got her email. One day, Liz arrived home from work to find that her garage had been vandalized. Upon pulling into the garage, she found that someone had written pour from Dave on the inside of her garage in spray paint. Liz calls the police and files a report. When Liz tells police that the common link between herself and Carrie is Dave Krupa, they decide to pay him a visit. The police show up at my work looking for me and they didn't look very friendly. I was the last known person, or at least the assumed last person to see her. As soon as they're looking at me with those police fan eyes, uh, that got me pretty rattled. Uh, you know, I pulled out my phone and said, no, she's lost her mind. She's going crazy. She's harassing me. Their tone certainly changed from an accusatory one to, oh, okay, we've seen this before. Meanwhile, back in Iowa, Carrie's mom doesn't know about any of this. All she knows is that her daughter's missing. Carrie's mother had filed the missing person report with the police, and she was becoming increasingly concerned with each passing day. In the weeks after she left, Carrie was still communicating with her family. She would send text messages to her mother, Nancy. When I'd get text messages, I would just say, please call me. I just need to hear your voice. And she would say, uh, well, this has got to be good enough for you. And Maxwell started getting texts saying, we're going to be moving you down to Kansas. You're going to go to school down there. And he was really scared. It was just shocking to me. Nancy is so concerned that she takes over guardianship of Max in Carrie's absence. In addition to her brother's wedding, Carrie was missing more family events. She was absent for her own birthday. She missed Thanksgiving. 
She wasn't around when her son Max turned 15. She even missed her own father's funeral. And when she didn't come home for that, her mother knew that something was very, very wrong. Carrie texted, I'm sorry I missed the funeral. Nancy responded, the only way I will know that this is you is if you call me and I hear your voice. The weather had changed and was starting to get colder. We went into her house and I noticed her winter coat was sitting on the chair. And I thought, she doesn't have any warm clothes with her. What, what is she going to do? How is she getting along? Where, how, where is she eating? What is she doing? It was terrifying. It was scary not knowing where she is. OK, maybe she had gone off her meds. There had been times in the past when she had thought, maybe I don't need these. The text got mean at one point, too, and saying that I wasn't a good mother and that I was controlling. In the middle of that bleak winter, only one thing was certain. People were afraid. While Carrie's family was afraid for her, Dave Krupa was growing afraid of her. I would regularly receive 60 plus texts a day, 100 emails a day. It was not uncommon. And as far as phone calls, hundreds of hundreds. And I'd changed phone numbers so many times, it was ridiculous. Carrie would refer to Liz in her messages. She is nothing. She's a fat cow. She looks like she lost her puppy. Maybe she'll do us all a favor and kill herself, LOL. She wrote to Liz, if you don't keep your hands and lips off my man, I will hurt you. And she seems to be everywhere. On one specific occasion, I was uh, sitting in my lazy boy with my feet up, watching TV, trying to relax, and it's nighttime. And I get a text saying, I see you. You're sitting in your chair with your feet propped up, wearing a blue shirt. And those things were true. She was no longer just ranting at a boyfriend that things didn't go well with. She was flat out stalking him. Carrie writes, my favorite thing to do is stand outside your window and stare at you. Then finally, there's a clue. One night in January, about two months after all of this started, Dave came home from work, and there was a vehicle in the parking lot. He got closer to the vehicle, uh, and he recognized it to be Carrie's Ford Explorer, because he knew it very well. That was how they met. He had worked on the vehicle. So I took a picture of the license plate, sent it to the police. He had no idea at the time how big of a piece of evidence this would turn out to be. It had one perfect fingerprint on it. In the weeks following Carrie Farver's disappearance, police in two different states are trying to find her, but for two totally different reasons. The police in Iowa are looking for Carrie Farber as a missing person. But less than five miles away in Nebraska, just across the Missouri River, police are looking for Carrie Farber as a stalker, somebody that is harassing Dave Krupa and Liz Gullier. They're all trying to find Carrie Farber. The best clue so far is Dave's discovery of Carrie's Ford Explorer. The police searched the car, and they found no fingerprints except for one. There was a mint container found in the car. It had one perfect fingerprint on it. But that fingerprint didn't match Carrie, and it didn't match anyone in the FBI's national database. So that lead, so far, is a bust. But Carrie's mother, Nancy, doesn't need evidence. She knew in her gut that something had happened to her child. I'd lay awake at night because every kind of scenario was going through your head as to what had happened. After Carrie's father, Dennis, died, Nancy Rainey had a dream he appeared in that dream. I had a very, very, very vivid dream that Dennis had come to me. And he said, Nancy, don't worry about her. She's with me. But of course, I was always, always kept hoping that we'd find her, that she was OK.
And then about five months after Carrie disappeared, Nancy gets this astounding phone call. I get the call from a gentleman that says that Carrie is at this Santa Francis homeless shelter and that she wants you to come pick her up. My heart just started. I was just so I was shaking and I thought, oh my God, we're gonna bring her home. She's gonna be okay. This was the first big lead they had since the finding of Carrie's vehicle that they thought might lead to finding her. So we go over there and we meet up with the investigator. The police had met them there and they asked Nancy to wait in the car while they went in. And they came back out a few minutes later shaking their heads. Carrie wasn't there. It was such a letdown and I was just devastated. I get this, just raising my hopes, and then it's dashed again. Carrie's friend Amber also got a message from Carrie saying that she finally wants to come home. She said, hey, I made a really big mistake, and um, I took off for a while, and I'm ready to come home now. And I was like, I'm here. Let's get you home. I could never get her to say that she would meet me anywhere. Carrie's son, Max, is losing hope. But just in case, he reached out to his mom on Facebook. All it said was hi, and she immediately wrote him back. Hey, little man, how are you? He asked her to answer three questions to prove that it was really her, what his middle name was, what the name of their first boxer was, and what his best friend's name was. And she never responded to that message. Then Carrie posts on Facebook, I've answered enough questions to prove myself. I'm not missing, I just don't want to come home right now. Meanwhile, the stalking of Dave Krupa and Liz Gullier has been escalating. As the months went on, he'd received thousands of texts and emails threatening him. The messages said things like, I hate you so much, I want to drive a knife through your heart. Hey, lose so am I ruining your life yet? Dave and Liz referred to Carrie as Crazy Carrie. That was what we would say, Crazy Cherry. Oh, Crazy Cherry this. Oh, I got another email from Crazy Cherry. The trauma that they were both going through brought them back together, and they started dating again. Rude, hostile messages come into both of their phones as they're both together. It was actually extremely common for us to be uh, hanging out, and both of our phones uh, would start blowing up with text messages and emails from Carrie. He had to admit he was impressed by Liz's loyalty. She was pissed at him for inviting a lunatic into their lives, but she was still there. And as this is going on, Dave is becoming almost numb to all this crazy stuff that's happening almost every day. I get an email, and it's a picture of what looks like Liz tied up in the trunk of a car. And it says, uh, I have Liz tied up in the trunk of the car, and uh, you need to call her right now and tell her you hate her. She's a whore, otherwise I'm going to kill her. I call Liz and I say, hey, you're not tied up in the trunk of a car, are you? No, no, ha ha, all right, good, good night. And at that point, it was just another day. It just wasn't even shocking anymore. Carrie even emailed Dave with a link to an obituary for Liz. In it, she writes, I didn't know her very well, except that she was a whore and a man stealer. Thank God she is gone. But as crazy as a fake obituary is, things get even creepier and deadlier. I get a call from Liz, frantic, freaking out. My house is on fire. Somebody's burned my house down. So I go over to Liz's house, and there's fire trucks all up and down the street, and there's firemen walking around, and there's hoses, and they're pouring water into place. Luckily, her children were not home, but many of her belongings were still there, including two dogs, a cat, and a snake, and they all were killed in this fire. There is audio of the officer at the scene talking to Liz about the fire. From what I've seen so far, looking inside, this is, it's 
pretty obvious this is an intentionally set fire. The guy that I'm seeing, he has a girlfriend that he dated for two weeks, and she's been stalking me since November. Do you know her name? It's Carrie. C-A-R-I. But she has made threats towards me and my kids. She would kept text me telling me she wanted to kill me and my kids. You would think they were married as much as she's stalking me. She oh, won't moving. leave me alone. She will not go away. I just wish she would go away. Well, I felt very bad for Liz because I felt like I brought this crazy person into her life. Two months later, Carrie strikes again. Dave's auto shop is vandalized with a message for everyone to see. Dave beats women in fluorescent orange spray paint. I tripped out. I mean, this is my job, and this is on a main street. Dave became a nervous wreck. He purchased a gun. He was always on edge. It makes you paranoid. You can't rest, you can't relax. You're always wondering when something else is going to happen and if it's going to escalate. We were in bed, getting ready to go to sleep. And the next thing I hear sounded like a gunshot. On the one-year anniversary of their first date, Carrie Farber sends Dave Krupa a message to my husband. The email included a photograph of a knife and a note saying that she'd been creeping around in his building. The stalking at that point was quite apparent that she had been in and around the building. Dave Krupa and Liz Goyer have been the focus of Carrie's stalking for over a year now. And this has bonded them but their relationship isn't really serious. Well, we were seeing each other, but she was doing her thing and I was doing mine. Dave has actively been trying to meet other women online, but it seems that Carrie doesn't want that to happen. One woman who I never actually met, she spent five minutes on my Facebook and that was all it took. She was a target, threatened to be killed, threatened to have their children killed. It was insanity. Gary seems to be monitoring his every move and keeping a close eye on his female friends. In January of 2014, I drove from Sioux Falls to Omaha to visit with Dave. I have known Dave since high school. Dave and I have just always had a special connection. We've always been more than friends. We were in the living room of the apartment, just chatting old times. Within a couple of hours, his phone was going crazy. Apparently, Carrie saw her come in. I actually got a uh, text to the effect of, I see you in there with that whore. He told me that he was having issues with an ex that was stalking him. A few hours later, we were in bed, getting ready to go to sleep. And the next thing I hear sounded like a gunshot to me, which was actually a brick being thrown through the bathroom window. I was in a panic. I didn't know what was happening. Police, they came over and talked to Dave for a few minutes. After the police left, Dave had me get into the car with him, and he said he needed to go check on Liz because Carrie had threatened Liz in the past prior to this incident with me. Despite all this drama, Liz Goyer is not scared off, and she and Dave try to just kind of go on with their lives, even going on a double date with her friend Cherokee. They were great together, Dave and Liz. They joked around. I know Liz wanted more but she wasn't that type of person that wasn't going to push herself onto someone. The stalking by Carrie is this dark cloud in their lives. They've been trying to get help from investigators for more than a year, but nothing puts a stop to the harassment. And it's not just Dave and Liz that are being harassed. Dave's ex and the mother of his children, Amy Flora, was also getting threatening messages from Carrie. 
calling her all sorts of names. I thought Amy was probably going to kill me because she got drugged into it. Mentally, it was a huge strain on everybody involved. Nothing was being done about it. The police had dropped it off at some point, so it was just something I had to deal with. Being stalked in her house was just part of life. The case had become cold. Detectives Ryan Avis and Jim Doty worked at the Pottawatomie County Sheriff's Office in Council Bluffs. Neither Avis nor Doty had actually been working on the case of the missing Carrie Farver, but they'd been aware of it in the police department. We'd heard about the case. It was kind of water cooler talk around the office. It intrigued us because it was a single mom who was very into her kid and family, and it just didn't make sense to us that she just vanished. Is there more to it? And is there something else that we're not seeing? It was something that we were both interested in just talking about it, but we didn't have the case file. You don't usually go and volunteer for a case, but in this, uh, this intrigued us enough that we asked, hey, can we take a look at it? See, we put a fresh new look on it. Doty and Avis asked their superiors if they could take another look at the Carrie Farber case. And so they began looking at it from a new angle. Jim's gonna work it like she's dead, and I'm gonna work it like she's alive. I'm gonna try and prove every which way I can that Carrie is still alive and is out there, and Jim's gonna try and prove every which way that she is not. Carrie's checking account had no activity. It's not normal for adults to just up and leave and literally spend no money, no one's seen them, and no one's heard their voice. I, it just, just didn't make sense. And one of the things about these text messages, they don't look like they're written by Carrie. They're filled with spelling errors and grammatical errors. And her mother said Carrie never would have sent messages like that. Detectives Doty and Avis were aware that Carrie had been diagnosed as bipolar, but they didn't think it had anything to do with why she went missing. How many people in the world are bipolar and they don't just go missing for no reason, whether they take their meds or don't take their meds? And life had been good for Carrie Farver. In fact, it had never been better. She had a good income, a good house. I had come to the conclusion that I could not prove she was actually alive. This is a turning point in this because they start to contemplate the idea, could it be that she's actually been dead this entire time? So if Carrie Farver was dead, what happened to her after she left Dave's apartment on that early morning two years before? The decision made by Doty and Avis to reopen the case would be a true turning point. If not for detectives Doty and Avis, chances are this case would never have been solved. They smelled a big fish, a big problem, something really weird. This investigation is about to take a left-hand turn that nobody saw coming that is mind-boggling. Everything you thought you knew was a lie.